So that's the idea. Now I'm going to skip, for reasons of time, I'm going to skip past the in vitro demonstrations and the detailed structure activity and so on and jump to some in vivo examples. So here's a tumor that happened to be marked with GFP, just for clarity so you can, everyone can see where the tumor is. Uh, and there it is marked. It's too bad human tumors don't come with GFP in them. This is only something you can do in a mouse, uh, implant uh, GFP transfected cells. There is the tumor, visible by bright field. The Psi-5 is the fluorescent, deep red fluorescent dye that we have attached to this peptide, which has nine negative charges. Sorry, there should be nine glutamates, but we took the amino group. Off. We didn't want an amino terminus throwing a positive charge at that end. So when you take one amino, amino terminus, what you've got left is succinyl, basically. Uh, so that's still nine negative charges. There's the arginine. This is the cleavable sequence that is one of the standard uh, substrates for matrix metalloproteinase 2. And so this is the other reason we like to work on proteases. We have a mechanism that requires cleavage as it's activating uh, um, chemistry. And uh, when this thing cuts uh, in the tumor, then what's left is the lagr 9 c psi 5 which has nothing but positive charge and therefore sticks to the tumor. In the healthy tissue where you don't have MMPs, this stuff remains intact. The succinyl blocks the and AEA8. The glutamates block the arginines, and the stuff doesn't stick, and the material washes out and goes out the kidneys into the urine, which, by the way, does turn blue. As an important control, if you uh, switch the chirality of all the amino acids, you can in here, the P's, the L's, and the A's, and make it D amino acids. Now, even though the molecule is exactly the same molecular weight and the same hydrophobicity, it's no longer subject to enzymes because, of course, enzymes are stereospecific. And the net result is that a similar tumor that is green by GFP now does not pick up the Psi-5. Now, that's one control, but that only tells you that some enzyme was necessary to cut it. And there is a question, obviously, is our PLGLAG actually selective for MMP2 and 9? And so the better way to do this uh, is to take a mouse. Now we have a mouse that's transgenically uh, generating tumors. This is a famous uh, standard breast cancer model in which the polyoma middle T uh, oncogene is driven by mouse mammary tumor virus promoter, so that makes a glucocorticoid breast cancer specific promoter. And so you get uh, well, tumors in the breast uh, growing up spontaneously, and we get a significant uptake. This is standardized uptake value for uh, some, this got lost. This, uh, that's the label. And in, in the wild type animals, or at least the, the mice with the normal tumors and the cleavable. Uh, Substrate, we get this much SUV. When we knock out MMP2 in these mice, or cross them into an MMP2 minus mouse, we only get a modest drop. Uh, and that's also true, if you, I think, if you knock out 9 only. But the basic problem is that 2 and 9 compensate for each other considerably. And you can check that and see it. When you get to a 2 homozygous knockout and a 9 heterozygote, you're beginning to have a real impact on and losing the uptake. And finally, when you get to 2, 9 full knockout, which are quite hard to breed, we get them at about 1% of the Mendelian or a few percent of the Mendelian frequency. But occasionally, you get one out, and then those ones will don't take it up any better than the uncleavable D amino acid version that shouldn't be cleavable by any standard enzymes. And therefore, we think that that argues that most of the enzyme-dependent uptake is due to none other than the MMP2 and 9 that we were hoping for uh, in some combination. We can also do this with drugs on xenografts using so-called MMP inhibitors of greater or lesser specificity. And uh, they will take the uptake down toward the level of the D amino acid control. Uh, small metastases develop in these uh, breast cancer model uh, mice. And uh, these are on, on the lungs, typically. And uh, when you look at the lungs of such an animal, you see these little fluorescent freckles, which turn out to be, uh, indeed, the tumors. So if you take one of the smallest ones, such as this one, I don't know if literally that one, when you look at it in higher magnification in hist histology, the fluorescence comes from a little nest of cells that is only on the order of 200 microns across, well under a millimeter. And in an adjacent section, you can find in by hematoxyl and eosin staining that this is indeed uh, cancerous tissue. This is one of the bigger nodules. Uh, and in particular, one notes that the fluorescence is most concentrated around the edge where the tumor meets the stroma in the in sort of inflammatory invasive front, not so much in the necrotic core 
of the tumor. And that makes sense because it's already known that the MMPs are particularly active around here. And that's also where we would most, we were happy to highlight the edge of the tumor uh, as much as the, uh, the core. So one of the cases where perhaps the main area where fluorescence is still of some potential use or imaginable use inside people is when you don't have overlying tissue. That doesn't just mean the skin, but, I, but I'd rather I mean surgery, which by definition you've already opened up the, uh, the patient. So here is a mouse that has an MDA MB435 xenograft uh, implanted under here under the skin, uh, and it's just been opened up. And this bloody view of the mouse is what surgeons have been looking at, the equivalent in people, for thousands of years to guide them. You just get, you know, you use your eyes, you see this abnormal mass, you cut it out. Now, well, it happens that this one was marked with GFP. Okay, there it is. Uh, but before we actually cut it out, you check in the peptide, and this was injected six hours ago in the tail vein, enough time for the, the, the stuff to wash out of normal tissue and remain retained in the tumor. That shows the red fluorescence. Uh, there is also some undesired background from things like cartilage and skin that was a problem with this very early version of the peptide. Uh, so it isn't perfect at this early stage, and that's the overlay. So Dr. Nguyen, my collaborator, who is a practicing surgeon, who she actually um, operates two days a week and works in the lab three uh, days of the week, she uh, used her technique and cut out uh, this tumor, and it's pretty obvious. Instead of throwing it away, she laid it alongside, and you can see it's GFP fluorescence, and it's still red. And you look at what's left, and most of you, I think, would be hard-pressed to tell whether there was any tumor left in there. And you don't even see anything on the GFP image. But in the red fluorescence, you can see this little extra suspicious dot that's not on the other side, and it shouldn't be there. So guided by this red fluorescence, she went digging uh, and uh, found a little lump of tissue hidden underneath the muscle and dug it out. And I hope you can barely, some of you at least in the front, can see that there is a little trace of green fluorescence there once you get the mus this bit of tissue pulled out from underneath the muscle. And now you can see some green. This is the magnification on a different scope that has higher magnification and a lot more light gathering power. And it is green, and it also has the Psi 5 red. So this is a very, very simple, naive uh, sort of example of how the fluorescence-guided resection could do a better job and catch residual tumor that you might have missed by conventional means. And just to remind those of you who are not clinically experienced, and I certainly didn't know this beforehand, if uh, you are on the operating table as a patient for, for cancer, the surgeon will take out everything that the surgeon can normally see, and then some extra, try to get some stuff around the edge just for safety margin, and then quickly send that, sends that to a pathologist, hoping that the pathologist will then report that all the way around the obvious bit of tumor, you have nothing but healthy tissue. And then the hope is that you got the entire tumor if it's encapsulated in all, all the dimensions. If you see some tumor leaking toward the edge and reaching the edge, the likelihood is that you left some tumor inside the patient, you, or the surgeon left some inside you, and the surgeon has to go dig some more. And that process of cutting sections while the patient is asleep takes on at least 15 minutes, sometimes longer. And you're asleep under anesthesia, and the pathologist is really rushed to take this bloody lump of tissue and cut some microscopic sections and stain them quickly. Can only do a quick sampling. And quite often, it turns out that either the two, there's a non-contiguous tumor mass, or you, there was a positive margin, but you just didn't happen to sample it. And you looked at here, and here, and here, and it looked good, so the patient got sewn up. You know, everyone was waiting around. Patient is under anesthesia, there's a lot of pressure to sew it up quickly, and then you find the next day with more leisurely examination, uh-oh, too soon. And uh, now you have the choice. Do you go back in and make the patient endure a whole other operation, or just give up and say, bring on the radiation and the chemo, or whatever. So it'd be a lot nicer if in real time the patient, the surgeon could see what they were doing, and I'll show you a little later what a movie of that looks like. But I mentioned that that's for surgery, but that's after we already know there's a tumor there. 
how about detecting it in the whole animal or a whole patient beforehand? And for that, we will need magnetic resonance imaging with gadolinium. In our case, is what we've been using. And we had to switch from little peptides to whole nanoparticles in which this entire dendromer, uh, which started at about 38 kilodaltons, and by the time it's decorated with all the stuff, gets to about 50 or 60 kilodaltons, we decorate this polymer with six copies of this peptide. The arginine ends are blue, and they're the ones attached to the dendromer, so that after we cut the linker and throw away the glutamate portion, which is always the acidic one shown in red, that this entire pinwheel is, becomes the cargo. And because the whole den, uh, dendromer, dendromeric nanoparticle, it's easy to load this up with gadolinium synthetically, then a lot easier than trying to put it directly on uh, the peptides, and we get better retention. So the result here, this is a, a mouse with a xenograft down here, HT1080, imaged in an axial scan at 7 tesla before injection. And there's the tumor, but it doesn't show a great deal of contrast against the rest of the body. These four circles are capillary tubes filled with different concentrations of gadolinium to serve as an internal reference, ranging from 250 micromolar, that's a heck of a lot of gadolinium, 50, 10, and 0 micromolar. So you see where I mean that you need on the order of tens of micromolar to begin to see a little bit of brightening over no gadolinium at all. That's the insensitivity that needs amplification. So in the tumor now, uh, this is 24 hours after injection. It takes longer than the six hours uh, that we could do with the free peptide. And that's because this larger particle has a much longer pharmacokinetics, which is good, gives more time for the, um, uh, the rather sluggish tumor proteases to finish chopping the thing up. And it happens, I'm told, to be clinically convenient. To, if you're going to go longer than a few hours, it's better to go to a full day, because then you get injected the day before you're going to have your scan. And that's, that suits people's schedules. Uh, and uh, now, uh, 24 or 48 hours later, the tumor is nicely lit up. And if you go to, instead to an uncleavable control in which these go back to being the D-amino acids instead of L-amino acids, then the tumor uh, at the same time point with the same amount of injection uh, is not lighting up. Once again, uh, arguing for that it is at least responding to an enzyme and not just, say, to the v passive vascular leakiness that also is true in tumors. Though that contributes somewhat. I mean, that gives you a little bit of contrast, but we think the enzymology also contributes significantly. And then we can take this particle and decorate it with both the MRI and the fluorescence because it's a you know, full-size nanoparticle, no problem putting some Psi-5 and some gadolinium on it. And then with one injection, you can both see the tumor by MRI, nicely lit up here, and then lay the animal on its back, open it up. And there you see this very same tumor, no, no fresh injections. This is the Psi-5 component uh, instead of the gadolinium component. <coughs> and then you, you do an operation. In this case, I think it was done with white light, not with the fluorescence. And then, we have, having sewn up the animal and done a repeat MRI scan, you see there's a big hole left where the tumor was taken out. But you look carefully at here, in particular, the magnification, and you see these suspicious little extra white dots at the edge, which argue that there were some invasive edges of the tumor that we didn't quite clean up. And sure enough, when you're guided by the MRI and then go with sacrificed animal and go hunt in these areas, you do find nests of tumor cells, as shown by the blue staining of the hematoxylin eosin. Whereas in this case, this was a more successful operation, I think, using fluorescence-guided surgery uh, and cleaning this up with fluorescence. And then the MRI looks much better uh, afterward. So, uh, and you don't have to do a fresh injection. Commonly, right now, surgeons often do MRI after surgery to check what they do, but they have to do a fresh injection of a non-targeted contrast agent, which has a lot of artifacts due to the trauma of the surgery itself. Whereas here, we haven't injected anything fresh. It's still the same molecules that deposited here. So as long as they haven't moved around, and we, think that, we do think that once they're, the protease releases them, they remain stuck for at least several days, uh, we, we shouldn't have that artifact. Eventually, about a week later, the stuff does wash out. It doesn't stay in forever. <coughs>